Right, so what we've done is distilled what we got out, out of the case study part of our research in Manaya Kalani. We did case studies of the sort of big splash writing teachers in Manaya Kalani. And we went, rather than just going in on the one day, like we've done sort of more generally, we went deeper with those ones. So we read through, you know, they were all planning online, so we read through their planning, we read through the kids' blogs, we emailed them, we talked to them, we got a sense of what they were trying to achieve. And here is the, the five key things that we think seem to be big splash things that they were doing. Um, we'll forget that. Um, and for your teachers, what I would ask them to do is think about, while they're listening to me rabbit on about these things, how might I use this? thing, whatever it is, to build the graph that I want to build for my learners, or to, to work on what I want for my learners, yeah. depending on what their hypotheses are. So the first one, was, am I the first one? I'm the first one. The first one is engagement. They, um, and this was writing classes, so, but I think it transfers to reading or math. In the most efficient classes, there was no time off task. So in terms of, there was all of the hour, say, that there is for a lesson is spent learning and very little time spent managing in those classes because the digital took that off the hands of the teachers and the teachers' time was all learning time. So learning conversations rather than management conversations and efficiencies, kids moving places, doing things quickly. So like in the most efficient class, I, one of the more efficient classes when I was watching, the next reading group came up and bumped the previous reading group off their chairs and said, right, it's our turn now, and te the teacher took a breath and off she went again. And that's how um, efficient the classes were and therefore maximising the learning time. In other classes we've noticed, um, you know, so quite downtime, particularly with students waiting, you know, they're waiting for the next activity, the next task, and um, you know, it just interrupts that flow. Mm. In, in non-digital classes that we watch, depending on where they are, there's a lot of time students spend waiting for things. Non-digital. In non-digital class, and, you know, they're waiting for the thing to be glued in their book, or they're waiting for the line to be broken. You know. They they finish the activity and twiddling their thumbs a bit, mm. waiting for the release of the next um, task. Mm. So that's more time actually in that hour. Sixty minutes of the hour is spent learning potentially. And then, within each minute of those 60 minutes, what we notice is that kids are able to do more stuff per minute. So they're actually producing more. Um, so getting through more writing. One of the things I noticed the first time I ever went to an English class was how much the students had written and were able to write in a given amount of time. Um, so that's the sort of the behavioural engagement stuff. And then there's the affective engagement around um, how kids feel about their learning and that whether they're engaged in it um, in that affective way. You know, kids who buy into the goals of the school and buy and the kids that we talk to bought into the goals of Manaya Kalani and feel um, worthy and feel like what the learning that they're doing is worthy and those sorts of things. And the interesting part of that, purposeful and interesting, that the learning that they're doing, the writing that they're doing, and along, and we know this about, um, especially at Anakahi, young people, the more student choice, the more ownership over the writing that they do. So that was the engagement piece. Um, the other affordance, and it's related to, um, it's related in some ways to the efficiency, there are more opportunities in um, those classrooms for powerful learning conversations. It's related to the efficiency because um, the teacher has got the space to engage in really deep, productive um, conversations with individual students and groups of students. Now, so it's, it's like what we know about um, giving quality feedback um, and um, you know, working, with, working with small groups. One thing we notice, for example, is that if, if you go into classes and there's a guided reading group going and that's the group that the teacher is um, engaged with it, at that time, because the other students in the class have got their own um, digitally managed independent learning going on, then the teacher with the guided reading group can give his or her 
full attention to the group um, that he or she is working with. Now it's not that situation and as a secondary teacher you know I'd be working with the group and part of my attention is kind of on the other corner of the classroom wanting to see um, if some mayhem is going to break loose. You know the teachers that we observed they don't have that situation they're just trusting that the kids are getting on with it because the kids are getting on with it and they, they focus and they're listening. So it's got that um, real formative feedback aspect of it. It means that the teachers know where the, where the kids are at and what they've got to do next and um, all of that sort of thing. The other thing it does is, um, because of the collaborative nature of the online environment, there's also a, a lot of opportunities for rich student-to-student -student, um, conversations in person and online. You know, so these classrooms that, um, in those case studies, were characterised by lots of lots of rich talk, and rich talk of that kind, you know, in the research literature is associated with things like if you're talking about text, that's associated with improvements in reading comprehension. If it's about um, subject area learning, deeper conceptual knowledge, you know, and in this kind of you know new ways of knowledge of deep understanding and Transformation, conversation, conversation um, is about thinking, you know, talking to think and all of that. Um, there's another aspect I was going to talk about with that. And oh, it's, a, it's the opportunity for the um, online discussion. We've noticed um, students who, who wouldn't necessarily be the ones in class to uh, put their hand up and ask for help. Um, can be more comfortable asking for help and engaging with a chat with students, uh, with their teacher online. And so they're accessing um, support from the teacher in class in real time or they're um, corresponding with the teacher out of, out of class when they're you know, doing some independent learning. So all of those powerful teaching conversations can make a difference. As Aaron said, the power comes in that ability to move children's thinking on, so they're learning or teaching conversations as opposed to doing or task conversations in many cases. Does that make sense? Um, and I always think about the first one, the engagement one, about if you're thinking of that as more time to learn or more opportunity to learn, this is more opportunity to teach. Um, the complexity piece is hard to achieve, I think, um, but it sits nicely inside Learn, Create, Share um, because using Learn, Create, Share, teachers are able to leverage up what they're asking of children. They're also able to leverage down, so this is something that you have to work at as a teacher to make sure you're leveraging up. But, you know, when in that learn space, because kids have access to texts that are written for adults or written for scientists or written for other sorts of audiences, this is giving them, this is taking ceilings away from what they're reading. And they're accessing multiple texts in order to understand something. So they're accessing texts at different levels, but also from different perspectives, different points of view, of different credibility, of different reliability, um, and in different modes. To build a really rich understanding of what, of what you're learning about, you'll be getting a much more powerful, multiple perspective understanding based on all those different texts that you're reading. So that enriches the learn part. It's two o'clock. Um, and then kids, because it's, they can access these, these really quite challenging texts, we do see students accessing what, what I call bootstrapping. You know, um, if, they ha if they aren't reading something they really don't get, they can go to a site where, they, where it's explaining it to them in simpler words. They can go off and find out the meanings of things. They can, or as you would if you were reading, I don't know about your grandmother's disease, you'd, you'd go to multiple sites to try and un un figure it out and understand it. Um, so they're scaff self-scaffolding a little bit around that. Then on the create space, um, we see students making what what we are calling, we have been calling digital learning objects, but they're student created ones. So students are creating new things based on what they're learning. And when you're creating something about your learning, you're having to reprocess it and put it in your own words or put it in your own mode. 
and you have, you're thinking through it again and again and again. And you know that from that stuff about I learn however much of what I hear and read and then I learn most of what I teach somebody else. So it's that part of the create part that helps them to learn it more deeply. And in the create part, in what I see, the really powerful part of the create part is not, is not pretty, but original. So it's about creative being the originality thing that the kids are doing with, with the new learning that they've got. Um, and we've got on here to think something no one has ever thunk. And we've put that there on purpose to see if it catches on. Um, but that idea that it's creative because it, it's new and no one ever thunk it before. And then when I share that, I'm now the expert because you've never thunk what I've thought. So um, I'm now the expert. And when I'm sharing, I, I wear that mantle of an expert over my knowledge. And we think that deepens learning. Um, with all of these affordances, but um, maybe particularly with this one, um, they're not inevitable products of moving into a digital environment because um, you can actually see that moving into a digital environment can, could conceivably um, um, rather than increase the cognitive challenge and demand it could reduce it so you might be able to productively engage students in busy work in the learn phase you know lots of um, constrained worksheet you know so we just replace traditional task sheets and short answer comprehension questions and things like that. So you know, that, that's, um, that's what could happen and what we think um, shouldn't happen. The same thing can happen with, um, you know, in the create, where people use the digital environment to create what I would say are trivial uh, learning objects, you know, and it would kind of be the digital equivalent of putting a pretty border around um, you know, around your work, you know, and you know, you can see that, but when it's used to, to create deep thinking, then that's going to make a difference. Um, next one um, that Rebecca's already uh, touched on is the, the idea of um, insight and on-site support as a scaffold. Um, Rebecca talked about bootstrapping, how students can use the digital environment to um, um, find out additional information and support support themselves. So they're reading something they don't understand. Um, they don't understand a word or some terminology. They can access a simpler text on the same topic, you know, and, and scaffold themselves that way. Um, we think that's really that affordance is really important because a general observation in our work and internationally is about this issue of scaffolding out as well as scaffolding in. I totally own this myself as a um, secondary teacher. I got I got really good at scaffolding students to do writing, for example. You know, so I would have planning activities and writing frames and all of those things that really support students to do, you know, reasonable pieces of work. What I wasn't nearly as good at was scaffolding them out so that the students gradually accept more responsibility for their for their own learning and so they become less reliant on teacher scaffolds. So you know, the digital means that the students hopefully become more responsible for accessing the scaffold themselves. You know, the way that we do. You know, I want to write a I want to write a particular type of letter. I might go and find an example of a letter that someone's written and kind of appropriate the tone uh, a little bit or look at the structure or or whatever. So that's really important I think in terms of the valued learning outcomes that you've identified as a group because you know the independent lifelong learner resilience all of those things are about um, you know scaffolding out and the students you know developing their own their own scaffolds and this speaks to that independence thing if you've got if you've on your site as a teacher um, got scaffolds for kids it it's an enabling them to become independent learners, right? They're not just going to be independent because you push them away and tell them to be. You've got to support them to gather those skills. And we see teachers using those site, their teaching sites to do that, you know, with rubrics or frames and whatever that, that can support, support kids along. Uh, the last one is the share part, the connections and visibility part. Um, we see, we saw out those, those big splash teachers making real um, leverage out of this visibility of the students' learning. 
the idea that students, especially in writing, are now connecting with a worldwide audience um, for real purposes. And if you're writing for a real purpose, and, and I've written some there, to inform others about my learning or to enlist others to my point of view or to get others to think something they never think, then you, you are the agent of that writing, you are the author. So it's about authorship and agency as well as writing ability. And, and students who can take action in the world and become the digital citizens, that I think you are talking about them becoming. And the other part of the visibility part is around teacher visibility and the connections with Fano and parents being able to look in, inside the classroom and see, see what their children are supposed to be learning and see what the children are learning by reading on the blogs and, the, and those um, connections between home and school. One, one contrast that I always think of in terms of the audience and purpose is um, as a high school English teacher, all the um, writing tasks that I set where students would write a letter to the editor in their exercise book. You know, so it was a pseudo-authentic um, pseudo, pseudo writing uh, task. You now it had all the properties of the real thing, but no one ever got to see it except for, except for me. You know, in, in terms of engagement and motivation and um, authenticity, you know, when they're writing for real purpose, real audience, they, you know, they have the potential to make a difference in the world or, you know, a small part of the world. The other thing we see on the students' blogs is that two-way connection. It's not just a one-way directionality with that relationship between home and school. We see children blogging from home. And, and teachers read the students' blog and finding out more about home as well. So it's a, that's important that that's that two-way relationship. And those students who've had their blogs for how many years now? Four or five years? Own those blogs and, and um, creating a persona through those blogs. So that's that. <laughs>